Among Britain's colonial wars in Africa, few gave him the same difficulty that the Zulu War had. The Zulu at the time of their war with Britain in 1879 were a relatively young state, only having become a kingdom in the late 1810s under the leadership of Shaka Zulu, who created a standing army and unified the previously confederated tribes of the region under a single leader. Shaka Zulu would of course be assassinated by political rivals, and the Zulu kingdom despite its external successes against enemy tribes would become internally stagnant. Years later, as the Zulu came to clash with Britain, they succeeded in repelling the initial British invasion of their lands and dealt significant casualties to the British. However, this invasion would be followed up on, and this time the Zulu would be defeated. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, the Zulu beat the British? Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another alternate history scenario for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this every week, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who's donated to us on Patreon, Utreon, and right here on YouTube through channel memberships. Your donations really go a long way to keeping this channel going, and by donating to us across any of these platforms, you'll get access to some great perks including physical merch, a custom designed flag wallpaper, and access to an exclusive members only Discord server where you can enter your scenarios for a chance to have them made into full videos. You can follow the pop-up on screen here, go to the comment section or description to visit any of these pages and support our channel, and of course you can do so by clicking the join button right below this video. If you can't donate anything, consider subscribing and sharing this video to help the channel out. Now, back to the video. The late 1800s were a period of change within Britain's empire. Its settler colonies began demonstrating greater capability for self-governance and acted with increasingly more autonomy. In the cases of Australia and Canada, the shared goals of multiple individual colonies also led Britain to see consolidation of the colonies into unified commonwealths. As a result of this, Britain began a reforming of its imperial governing model, and South Africa soon became a region of interest. However, unlike Canada and later Australia, there was much dispute within South Africa. The general consensus among the various settler populations of South Africa was that the colonies simply were not homogenous enough to justify consolidation. The liberally-minded Anglo-South Africans of the Cape dreaded what might become of their politics if they were brought into union with the highly conservative Dutch populations of the Boer Republics, who in turn refused to accept the egalitarian policies of the Anglos given their own existing hostilities with various black tribes. This is not even mentioning the situation of the black South Africans, who would have constituted a majority within a unified South Africa, and a number of whom hadn't even been made official subjects of the empire. The Zulu were among these unsubjugated peoples, and given their warlike tendencies, local British authorities recognized the Zulu kingdom as a threat to long-term peace and stability in the region. Despite the objections of various South African populations, figures within Britain pressed forward with this plan of consolidation for sheer need of imperial reform. Britain was developing increasing responsibilities and found itself tied in more and more engagements abroad. In the eyes of colonial leaders, Britain could not afford to waste valuable time and attention on colonies which, for the most part, were capable of governing themselves and resolving their own issues. Britain believed that the Cape Colony should want to consolidate and secure its control over the region instead of remain divided between its Anglo, Dutch, and African populations, something which had been a source of concern for Britain as the Cape had been a valuable waypoint for the British to connect their eastern and western realms. This would lead the British to call the Zulu to disband their army, which the Zulu squarely refused, and in response, an invasion was launched which was swiftly repelled. Local British leadership stationed within South Africa, determined to defeat the Zulus and restore their reputation before they were replaced by imperial authorities, would launch a subsequent reinforced invasion and successfully crush the Zulu. But this time, things are different. Realistically, the greatest victory the Zulu would have been able to muster would have been to merely hold onto their lands and remain fully independent. Though they were formidable for an African nation, their ability to weaken Britain's presence in South Africa was extremely limited, still relying upon primitive weaponry and lacking the internal stability and leadership to overwhelm British South Africa. Consequently, a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Zulu would almost certainly cripple British efforts to promote consolidation in South Africa and leave the Cape Colony to remain temporarily as it was, further preventing the Anglo-Boer Wars and seeing the Boer Republics remain independent at least for the time being. Though we may possibly see them become subjects of Britain some decades following the scramble for Africa, but with a greater degree of autonomy than in our world. A perpetually independent Zulu kingdom would have likely sought to achieve a greater degree of modernization for means of deterring future invasions, but Zulu social views may have limited this, as firearms were commonly perceived by the Zulu as dishonorable and cowardly weapons. Access to such weapons would have been restricted but not impossible thanks to the neighboring Boer republics, though tensions would have also existed with those states. An outside threat may have also served to provide the Zulu a sense of internal solidarity, reducing the risk of political assassinations and power struggles, and allowing for a more centralized leadership and government structure to emerge. 
This being said, though the Zulu Kingdom would advance to a higher level of development over the decades, it likely would not reach the same level of development that its fellow independent African state of Ethiopia had as the Ethiopians held a much older history throughout which they had a greater degree of interaction with the rest of the Old World. If Ethiopia could be called the Iran of Africa in that it both held a long history of development and remained largely independent unlike their neighbors during the age of colonization, the Zulu Kingdom would be like Afghanistan, technologically very behind but also difficult to conquer on account of fierce resistance from the population. As time went on, the Zulu Kingdom could be expected to become a patron of South African independence movements, especially during the World Wars and the Cold War, when it would begin receiving funding and resource support from Germany and later the Soviet Union, for the sake of weakening Britain's influence in the region. Though it's also quite possible the Zulu might become an anti-colonialist and anti-communist force in Africa, much like Malawi, given their monarchical and conservative nature, and in which case it would still receive support to promote independence movements in the region, but on behalf of the US instead of the USSR. Realistically, that would have been the most likely outcome for a Zulu kingdom that remained independent. However, what Indian Potato Farmer has specifically been asking us for months by this point is not just if the Zulu beat the British, but if the Zulu beat the British out of South Africa. You've waited for this for a long time, so we're gonna make it happen. Let's suppose for the sake of this scenario that just about everything that could have gone right for the Zulu does go right. This means three primary things. One, better leadership. The Zulu king of the time, Setshwayo, was far from the leader his half-uncle Shaka had been, despite his attempts to emulate him. Setshwayo did not demonstrate significant ambitions beyond maintaining his own authority and was regarded by the British and the Boers as being both too trusting yet too deceitful to be trusted, costing him both alliances and tactical opportunities. Had he been more ambitious and pragmatic, he might have found himself in a better position to challenge British authority and seek not only the continued independence but expansion of the Zulu kingdom. 2. Better Technology If the Zulu were to drive the British out of South Africa, they would need much greater firepower than spears. Now the firearms the Zulu were in possession of were few and outdated. The Zulu moving beyond their aversion to firearms and acquiring a greater supply of weaponry would be essential. For the sake of the scenario, we'll assume they procured them from the Boer Republics, seized them from British armories, or acquired them from defecting Africans within the Cape Colony of which there were a good number, and many of which resented the British replacement of the local Cape government and expansion plans. 3. Better Alliances The Zulu were not the only population opposed to the expansion of Anglo-South Africa. Not only other tribes, but the entirety of the Boer population had resented and feared continued British expansion in the region. Had the Zulu made peace with these populations, they might have had the manpower behind them to effectively drive Britain out of South Africa entirely. For the sake of this scenario, we'll assume that all these factors come together and the Cape Colony collapses, seeing a mass exodus of the tens of thousands of the some 300,000 non-native South Africans at the time a population size not too dissimilar from that of Rhodesia a century later during its population exodus. What would follow in South Africa would be the significant expansion of the Zulu Kingdom into an empire that now encompassed Sotho, Tswana, and Kosa lands, as well as a great portion of the former Cape Colony. The remainder of the Old Cape population, a combination of native Africans, mixed race individuals, and a small minority of remnant white settlers would hold out in an independent rump state along the coast, having cut ties with Britain for their attempt to undermine the local government. Aside from the Zulu Empire, the Boer Republics would gain significant land as well, primarily the Orange Free State who would have claimed territory in the far west, finally providing the Republic access to a coastline, and the newly formed United States of Stella Land. With Britain expelled from the region, the Republics may begin considering union among themselves for the sake of long-term survival. The Orange Free State with its access to the coastline, and the Republic of Transvaal with its much larger population, as well as the respective resources of both countries, would serve to benefit each other, and might become essential if the Zulu ever decided to turn against them. For the sake of the scenario, to assure this outcome isn't immediately undone, we'll assume that in exchange for rights over their captured lands, the Boer Republics and the Zulu agree not to seek further expansion into each other's currently held territories. And that Britain, rocked by this loss, abandons attempts to reclaim South Africa much as it had the 13 colonies, perhaps justifying this on the grounds of having more important matters to focus on between the changing dynamics within Europe and the management of India. Still needing to maintain its trade empire, Britain begins pursuing alternative means of interlinking its lands. Namely by further developing Canada's port cities on both coastlines and expanding the country's railway network. Allowing Britain to rapidly ship and transport goods and people from London to Montreal to Vancouver and out to Australia, New Zealand, India, and East Asia. As a result of this, Canada sees a greater degree of investment by Britain and would almost certainly emerge far more developed and populated than in our world. Additional future expansions by the Zulu could be expected at the expense of the Swanga tribe, followed by the Metbele tribe, which was founded by a lieutenant of Shaka Zulu who had turned against him. 
This tribe had been a mutual adversary of the Zulu and the Boers and might provide them another opportunity to collaborate, or could drive them to clash as both seek to capture the Metbele's land for themselves. Even if Britain does not pursue a reconquest of the region, South Africa would almost certainly come up in discussion during the Berlin Conference just some years later. This could once again see the Boer Republic, Zulu Empire, and Cape State come together to prevent encroachment upon their land, or if they fail to cooperate, could see the Boer Republics claimed by the Dutch or the Germans, the Cape State retaken by Britain, and the Zulu Empire seized by the Portuguese, British, or Germans. But what do you think? What might have happened had the Zulu beat the British out of South Africa? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. The US of Z thanks you for watching, Mr. Z, out.